Welcome everyone to Archaeology Abridged with Dr. Monica Smith. We're just giving people some time to call in, so we'll be starting in a few minutes. Uh, in the meantime, I just want to remind everybody that we are recording this lecture. And um, please do not record the lecture yourself. We will be posting it to our YouTube channel later today. Thank you so much. Just a reminder, we'll be starting in a few minutes as more people join us. Well, I think we'll get started. Hello and welcome. I'm Letitia LaFollette, the president of the AIA, and it is my great pleasure to introduce our speaker today. Um, it's also great fun to actually see all where you are all coming from in the chat. Just a reminder that if you have questions, please use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Um, that way we can feel the questions a little bit better, uh, but we do love to see where you are. So Dr. Monica L. Smith is professor in the Department of Anthropology and professor at the Institute of the Environment and Sustainability at the University of California, Los Angeles. She holds the Navin and Pratima Doshi Chair in Indian Studies and is the director of the South Asian Archaeology Lab at the Coatsen Institute of Archaeology. Dr. Smith received her BA in Classical Studies, Ancient Rome and Greece at the University of California, Santa Barbara her MA in archeology span from UCLA, and her PhD in anthropology from the University of Michigan. Dr. Smith's extensive field experience includes participations on projects in eight countries, England, Italy, Tunisia, Egypt, India, Madagascar, and Bangladesh, as well as with the National Park Service in the American Southwest. Her books include the, include the recent cities, the first 6,000 years, a prehistory of ordinary people, published by Simon and Schuster in 2019, which I highly recommend. And I don't know if you can actually see the picture. Um, I have the book right next to me. Um, Dr. Smith's talk today is entitled The Secrets of an Ancient Indian City. And it is informed by her long running archeological project in Eastern India that she co-directs with support from the US National Science Foundation, the National Geographic Society, the Wenner Gren Foundation for Anthropological Research and the American Institute of Indian Studies. Welcome, dear Monica, and thank you for agreeing to share these secrets with us today. 
and launched the 2021-22 season of the AIA series, Archaeology Abridged. I'll turn it over to you. Thank you so very much. It is really wonderful to be here for the AIA and for a wonderful international audience. It is always fantastic to be able to talk about an amazing part of the world, and that is the Indian subcontinent, and to be able to talk about our research projects and to talk a little bit about what it is that makes archaeology so fascinating from the perspective that you don't necessarily see in the movies and on TV. So this is the real deal. And I want to take you now to my screen where we will talk about this amazing opportunity to think about the secrets of an ancient Indian city. And you'll notice here that I also want to bring in my colleague, friend, and co-director, R.K. Mahanti, with whom I have been working for about the last 20 years or so. And uh, here we are in Eastern India, and we have not only been working together, but also traveling and seeing other archaeological projects and working with colleagues from the Archaeological Survey of India, which is the government body of archaeology in India and the Arisa State Department of Archaeology and many, many wonderful Indian colleagues and graduate students from all over the subcontinent. And so uh, when I say we, I really mean a, a really big team of people who have been working with us uh, for a very long time and all of the local individuals who are also working on our team. So uh, first and foremost, thanks to them as a way of understanding how it is that archaeology is really all about teamwork. So when we think about the Indian subcontinent, what we want to do is to mentally erase the boundaries that we have of modern nations today, because of course this is a very geologically and geographically diverse region with mountains and deserts and coastlines, seashores and rivers that in the past was crisscrossed by many different political groupings, many different cultural groupings, many different language groupings. And the time period that my colleagues and I are particularly focused on is what's called the early historic period. So this is the time period from about the third century BC to the fourth century AD. And this is a time when there were some very significant developments in the Indian subcontinent that afterwards, of course, had a long resonance. Uh, one of them is Buddhism and closely related and alternative religions such as Jainism and Ajivakism that were brought into existence by real individuals and then became part of the long running religious continuity of the Indian subcontinent. So that's one of the things that's happening in this time period of the early historic, which is, you know, when you think about it, roughly contemporaneous, of course, with the Roman world. So while the Romans are in the Mediterranean and the Han are in China, we also have very many diverse, active political and religious groups happening in the Indian subcontinent. Another thing that's very important about this time period is that this is when we get writing that we can actually read. If you're familiar with the Indus culture of the second millennium uh, BCE, then you'll notice that there are also some writings from the Indus period, but we can't really read them and they're very short uh, so that if we ever decipher them, they are probably not going to tell us a great deal. In contrast, by the early historic period, we have lengthy texts, many of them in stone inscriptions that are political proclamations. We later have religious texts, and then we have poetry and drama and medicinal texts and many other things that enable us to understand directly from the words of the ancient people of that time. And the third very exciting thing that we have developing in this early historic period is the development of cities. And this is a contemporary 2000 year old depiction of an ancient city. And it really gives you that vibrancy of the early urban environment that you have people in tall buildings and you have people out there in the public places, you have animals, you have architecture, you have that kind of urban hubbub that is really the hallmark of urbanism wherever and whenever in the world we find it. 
So the thing about this early historic period is that all of these things come together. You have these new religious movements, you have writing as a way of political and social documentation, and then you also have the development of urbanism where you've got thousands of ordinary people coming into these vibrant urban locales. So you might ask, well, if there are so many wonderful, vibrant urban locales, how did I pick? You know, how do archaeologists actually identify places that they want to go and work? And knowing that these research projects often take many, many years and really become part of a person's career in so many personal and professional ways. So this is how Shishapalgar, the city of which we will speak its secrets today, came into my professional perspective. I had actually done my dissertation research in central India, and that was at a relatively modest town-sized site where I looked at the integration of that town with its economic hinterlands. I found that people were well integrated with a wide variety of raw materials stretching out dozens or even hundreds of kilometers into the hinterlands. And I asked myself, if that's what happens in a town, what happens in a city? So I looked around at the published records of about 100 archaeological cities that are known from the Indian subcontinent. And I was fortunate to be able to locate a site that had a very distinctive quality. Now, this is a site that was intensively occupied and that had some of the very first independent research in India in the 1940s, including some very early aerial photography. And you'll see from the magic of aerial photographs, this magnificent surrounding fortification wall. And when you visit the site today, you still have that sense of magnificent grandeur that endures after 2,000 years. What makes this city of Shishpalgar distinctive is that unlike many cities elsewhere in India, for example, along the Ganges Plain, Shishapalgar did not seem to be occupied after the early historic period which made it an ideal candidate for a whole site survey, which would let us understand that entire kilometer square of the ancient city within its fortifications and be able to assess how it is that an ancient city integrated with its hinterlands and how it functioned for the many thousands of ordinary people who came into the site. So this is an image of the monolithic pillars that are at the center of the ancient city of Shishpalgar that are still standing after these many hundreds of years. And I can tell you that the site is really magical because you get that sense of legibility when you walk into the site. You get that sense of grandeur of an ancient metropolis. And we were also very fortunate because this site had been excavated in 1948 by Professor B.B. Lal, who subsequently became the Director General of the Archaeological Survey of India. And I'm happy to say that Professor Lal is very much with us and has been a tremendous supporter of this research project uh, from its very beginning. So uh, we have much to thank him for, uh, not only for the professional publications that were the groundwork for our research, um, but also for his continuing uh, cheerful and enthusiastic support. So you'll see here at the top the gateway of the ancient city, one of the eight magnificent formal gateways, and the gateway that Professor Lal excavated in the 1940s. You'll also see again those pillars that have a mysterious orientation, and from the ground surface today, you have a difficult time seeing exactly what kind of building that was, but that was one of the focal points of our investigation too. And then finally, the magnificent rampart that surrounds the site and is still present today. This looks like a natural linear hill, but it's not. It is entirely human made from many, many millions of baskets of earth 
that were carried to this location and used to make a formal rampart that was not only good for defense, but simultaneously something that served as an urban perimeter every single day. After all, warfare is episodic and generally short in human history, but fortifications and urban identity last for centuries. The first thing that we did at the site of Shishpalgar was engage in an archaeological survey. Now, most of the time, you'll think of archaeologists as people who are digging something. And yet, before we dig, we certainly want to get a good look at all the other aspects of the city that we can see. Because an archaeological site the size of a city is enormous. There is no such thing as an archaeological city that has been fully excavated because they are just too large. So what we do first, and in addition to excavation, is we look at the surface remains, we document whatever kinds of monumental architecture are still remaining, and then, and only then, do we proceed to more invasive techniques. So you can see here the kinds of things that we were doing in the archaeological survey, and the kinds of remains that we were finding. You'll notice in the middle, that there's a basket of broken potsherds. And you know from watching and hearing about archaeology that archaeologists are often inordinately keen to study little broken bits of things. You might not think that this basket is particularly promising, but let me tell you what's exciting in this collection of finds. Now remember, this is material from the surface of the archaeological site. So it's been in the plow zone, it's been turned around, and it's quite fragmentary, but we can still tell a lot. I'll bet your eye is already focusing on this potsherd that has a decoration. We know that decorations are not necessary for the functioning of a pot for cooking or carrying water. So what does it say about ancient technologies that we have decorations on utilitarian things? That's right, a sense of urban style comes down to even the most basic objects. Let's see what else is in the basket. Well, here's a potsherd that's kind of dark. It's a black color. And now you realize that there are very few black potsherds in this basket of the collection from a particular unit on the surface of the site. Now, why is that? Well, one of the things that we're thinking when we analyze this pottery is that black potsherds actually take a little bit more labor to make because you have to close the kiln so that no air gets in. So pottery is naturally red. And if you look at, for example, the uh, pots that you might have on your balcony, those terracotta pots, you'll see that they're red because that's the natural color that pottery gets when clay is fired and it turns red in the kiln in the process of hardening. To get a black potsherd, you've got to close that kiln, which takes more work. Now, if you're thinking about pottery and labor investment, you're thinking about how the ways of making things indicate what people are willing to pay extra for. And what we can see from these kinds of potsherds is that while black pottery might have been attractive, it probably wasn't worth the extra cost for most of the people living at the site. So it turns out to be a little bit rare. The third thing that your eye might be falling on is this. This is the rim of a huge vessel. And you know from looking at your own teacups or your own cereal bowls that the diameters are indicated by even just a little piece of the arc when you're unfortunate enough to break something in your own kitchen. But this potsherd could only have come from a really large vessel which means that it's the kind of thing that people are using to cook or store in quantity. And what we found over the surface of the site is that not everybody's got these big vessels. So even from surface remains, you can start to look at the differentiation of an urban economy on a scale of thousands of people's 
uses of artifacts. Suppose you want to go a little bit deeper. You want to go under that surface and see what it is that's happening under there and with the kinds of constructions or different activity areas in the regions of those famous pillars that you can see here in the background um, or underneath all of that thick grass where you can't even collect artifacts because they're obscured by the vegetation. Magnetic gradiometry and other techniques of remote sensing are magical ways of looking at the subsurface of a site, even before you dig or in conjunction with excavation, because this methodology can cover a much larger area than would ever be possible to excavate. And so this is what we did in collaboration with Timothy Matney of the University of Akron, who came over and was able to look at large areas of the site. Now you'll notice this computer readout on the right hand side looks pretty fuzzy. And one of the great things about collecting this kind of computerized data is that in the lab in the evenings and in the afternoons, You've got a lot of people squinting at the readout screen to see what kinds of patterns they can discern from the subsurface variable density of features like walls and structures and other kinds of subsurface activities that we know are underground. So let's join them and squint a little bit at some of the readout. If you look at this uh, display, you'll see in the middle of the image this kind of long linear anomaly. And yes, there it is. And what this is that we saw in an area over 300 meters long, which is about you know, the length of a city block, what we can see is a road that came in from the ancient gateway. This is much larger than we could ever hope to excavate or that could be ethically excavated with the kinds of careful techniques we have now. Really excavations are kind of a surgical strike in areas where we have already identified something through these geophysical techniques. So this is what we've been able to do at the site without even digging. We look at the surface when we can, we look at the subsurface in order to be able to look at these broader patterns of investment and activity. Finally, after all of those types of investigation have gone on, we use excavations to evaluate the chronology, to get a more diverse array of artifacts, and to look at the surface of the site as ancient people would have experienced it. So along with a dedicated team of local workers and many Indian graduate students, we commenced a large scale series of excavations. And this is where you really had the opportunity to find out the secrets of the site. Because there were many things that were only barely visible on the surface that of course turned out to have a long depth in the archaeological site, including this area of the monumental pillars where we had some stubs that were visible on the ground. And when we started to do the excavations, we realized that there were many more pillars than were currently on the ground. And it enabled us to say something much more comprehensive about the style and structure of the building. And it was a very exciting time, of course, as you can imagine, because as the students were excavating in their individual trenches, we would hear things like, I've got a pillar, and I've got a pillar, and somebody else would say, yes, I've got two in my trench. So this discovery of the remnants of monumental architecture was really extraordinary not only for our sense of discovery, but for the sheer amount of investment that had taken place in this ancient architecture by the inhabitants of Shishpalgar. And you can just imagine you know, the sense of making these monolithic pillars, bringing them into the city and the fanfare of putting up this monumental building. 
And one of the things that archaeologists often do, of course, is we excavate in nice rectilinear places. We have square trenches, and we generally expect that ancient structures also will be square. But uh, as often happens in archaeology, one day you wake up and you look at what's happening and you realize that you have something altogether different. And one of the reasons why this pillar structure had not been understood before is that it is not a square structure. It is an apsidal or round one. And in order to illustrate this, we asked all of the women who worked with us um, to please one afternoon wear their red or yellow sari and come out to the site. And we placed them where we knew that there were pillars and anticipated that other pillars uh, had yet to be found. So this, I think, is a beautiful way of showing that kind of human aspect of archaeology, both in the present with our research team and the sense of inhabiting the past in ways that really bring an ancient city alive. Our excavations also went deep about six meters deep, all of the layers of the ancient habitation, including places like another of the ancient gateways that had not been excavated previously, the rampart itself, and many, many areas of ordinary habitation. We found that the earliest occupation of the site uh, had earlier dates than anyone had expected. So by about the sixth century BC, we have the earliest occupation at the site of Shishpalgar, and that is the same as the earliest dates of occupation elsewhere in India. So what we can see is a vibrant urban network of activity all happening at the same time. But getting to the early occupation wasn't easy. As you can see, we hit the water table before we hit the end of the archaeological deposits. In our activities at the site, we were particularly interested in seeing what the lives of ordinary people were within this great metropolis. After all, we usually know why political leaders want to come to cities, but we were interested in knowing why the other tens of thousands of people came. We know that cities are sometimes bad for your health. They're crowded, um, they're often uh, you know, challenging, they're certainly expensive, as we experience today. And yet, once cities started anywhere in the world, they were so popular, you really couldn't keep people out. They came flocking in no matter what. And so we see this effect also at Shishpalgar where we have these many houses that are juxtaposed in crowded neighborhoods and would have provided a very lively urban scene. We know that many of the housing structures were sort of of the do-it-yourself variety, um, that people were using broken materials and reused bricks in ancient times. It was a kind of uh, architectural recycling that then enabled them to modify their houses and structures as they saw fit over the course of their individual and household lifetimes. But you know, people had a sense of style. And what we found is that when people used broken bricks to make their houses, they would turn the broken part in to the filling of the wall. So that from the outside, when the neighbors passed by, it looked like they were using pristine materials. We also found that there was an enormous amount of trash. So if we think that you know, a lot of waste is a modern phenomenon, I can assure you from having worked not only at Shishpalgar, but other urban centers, that trash is not a modern phenomenon. It's a human phenomenon that really accelerates in the urban environment. And as we were excavating, we were finding every day hundreds of kilos of pottery. And this is the pottery from about two days excavations. Uh, as you can imagine, an excavation that lasts for many seasons over a number of years accumulates an enormous amount of broken pottery that we then scrutinize for things like what we saw in the basket. 
decorations and labor investment of manufacture, and then sizes that indicate what people are doing in their households. We notice that that sense of urban style comes through in even the humblest potsherds. And we also get a sense of changes in decoration and changes in style. So just like our grandmother's China does not look like our China, people in ancient cities also shifted, modified, and updated their designs. We also found an enormous number of clay ornaments that were part of the discards that we found in the ancient trash. And these clay ornaments are really just about the cheapest form of ornamentation that you can possibly imagine. They're made out of clay, which is sort of like the ancient version of plastic. Once you had a skilled manufacturer make a mold, you could have any fairly unskilled person turn out hundreds of these kinds of ornaments. And you can see that they all have you know, quite different designs. There are florals, there's geometrics, um, there's all kinds of bangles and bracelets and rings and you know, ear spools and pendants. And we definitely got the sense that new waves of fashion would come in, you know, maybe geometrics would be in for a while, and then somebody would innovate floral designs and people would take their old geometrics and just throw them in the trash. We also noticed that there were a number of animal motifs that were part of urban design. And we can see that this idea of style and fashion also touches on the human environmental and human nature aspect. Of course, there were probably not very many elephants in the actual city, but the idea of elephants was very popular. If we look at what we can achieve through archaeological excavation, that sense of deep time and change, what we see is that there are some very significant changes in the material life of the ancient people of Shishpalgar. That in the lower phase, there was a more carefully curated set of artifacts. Pottery tended to be quite elaborate and decorated, and people even scratched designs on them probably is a mark of ownership. As the city went on hundreds of years later, what we saw is a gradual movement towards exuberant efficiency and that kind of old style, labor intensive black pottery no longer was made. Um, this is when you start to get many more terracotta ornaments, very rapidly made kinds of um, pottery, um, very expedient kinds of designs, and then also things like permanent architecture. So in the early parts of the city, um, we don't have these kinds of bricks and tiles from permanent architecture. So people are clearly making their household investments in different aspects that include things like architecture rather than such careful curation of artifacts. We also see some changes in foodways over time uh, with many more animal bones in the lower section of the site and uh, many fewer as we get up towards the top. The amazing thing is that this transition period, what would have been a significant change in life ways that would have made grandparents and grandchildren have very different experiences in their urban worlds is something that happened in a transition of maybe less than 100 years. So we can see how a city that was as long lived as Shishpalgar, as a place where there is tremendous resilience of location, but tremendous innovation of design and everyday life. I'm going to show you one of my favorite images from our excavations at Shishpalgar as a reminder of this intensely human aspect of the ancient city. So one of the things that we do as archaeologists is that we dismantle architecture in order to be able to see how it was made, and then, of course, to be able to dig down from one layer to the next. In this moment of dismantling of the rampart wall, a brick wall that would have augmented those millions of baskets of earth, as we lifted up a layer of bricks, we saw this. 
These are the ancient fingerprints of the mason who was building the wall. And that moment is just a snapshot, like an instant of that person putting some mud in between the two layers of bricks to get on with the job. But it gives us a beautiful image of the people who made an ancient city possible. That legacy of our research, of Professor Lal's research, of outreach to communities has come in a variety of forms and publications and interactions and media with many, many audiences. And it is absolutely a pleasure for us to be able to share this with you as the audience and as a way of thinking about a place that is very far away on the other side of the world for many of us, um, but one that yields some secrets that we then recognize in our own urban world as well. And so I would like to close with great appreciation to all of the literally hundreds of people who have worked on our project over the years who have made this realization uh, possible and who have given us so many insights into the secrets of an ancient city. Thank you so much again for joining and I very much look forward to the questions. Thank you so much, Monica, that was great. Um, we have several questions. Um, the first one actually is from Judy Friedman who wants to, who was hoping you can explain the geographical context so we could understand why a city was situated where it was? That's a wonderful question because anytime we think of a city, whether it's Tokyo, London, Paris, Jakarta, um, you know, Cusco, wherever we think of uh, placements of cities, we think that they ought to be very logical. And sometimes they are. So right on a river um, or at the crossroads of trade routes or you know, places where you might have a merchant community that then attracts other kinds of settlements. In the case of Shishpalgar, it's interesting because the site as this beautifully planned rectilinear space was put right on prime farmland. And if they had wanted to save their farmland and put the city in a location where it would not, you know, use up those resources, there is a laterite upland. So laterite is a kind of a compressed, crumbly, uh, you know, non-agricultural kind of rock that is very hummocky and, uh, you know, it, it's, it's a good substrate. It's very solid. If they had wanted to put the city in a place where they would conserve their agricultural resources, they would have put it up on that upland. But, you know, just like many of our suburbs today are paving over farmland uh, because we want to have nice level spaces and, you know, good land for lawns and things like that. Uh, the people of Shishparga also wanted to have that kind of tabula rasa, that clean slate. And that's why they put the city there. So they were sort of in between that laterite upland and the river, so close enough for trade, but they really had a sense of planning to make it perfect. Great. Um, so Valerie Thibault wants to know um, about the water table. Um, does the fact that you hit the water table mean that of course the water table was different in antiquity? Yes? Yes, very much so. So one of the things that is the most difficult for archaeologists as well as anybody else to do is to look at a landscape and try to imagine it other than what we see right now with our own eyes. And one of the things that has changed in the water table is that with dams, you know, all over the world, not uniquely in India, um, water tables fluctuate because dams are retaining water in the landscape. And then, of course, sometimes water tables go down as people are pumping out water. So the whole uh, hydrology of archaeological sites is often extremely complicated. So another thing which actually my colleague, uh, Professor Mohanty, has suggested <clears throat> is that perhaps the rampart was a way of capturing water. And we have found a number of wells in the archaeological survey that date back to the early historic period. So he's suggesting that maybe the containerization was something that hydrologically 
helped to preserve the city's water supply. Of course, it is, uh, you know, it would have been very helpful for ancient people, very difficult for us now, because we can only get a sense of those early levels, because they're below the water table, by pumping. That's the only way that we can see below that water table now. So all of the materials that we got from those lower levels were very hard won, I can tell you, from you know going down through and, and pumping out as we were excavating. It was, it was a tough job. Yeah. Um, so several people are interested in um, what uh, you found that might connect to religious uh, events and, and religious developments at the time. So Buddhism, Jainism, uh, Ashoka, et cetera. Right. So if you're familiar with the story of Ashoka and his transition to a Buddhist refrain from taking life, it was from the Kalinga War, which is historically thought to have occurred in around 260 BC. And it was after this war when the Gangetic Emperor Ashoka comes sweeping down the Indian subcontinent into this exact region of Eastern India. And there was such a great loss of life that he felt remorse and he, you know, turned away from warfare and was really the first great political patron of Buddhism and Buddhism from that point, from the third, second century BC, um, started to become extremely popular and very widespread. Now, in our archeological investigations, at the household level, we have very few overt signs of religious activities. Uh, we have a couple of terracotta ornaments that have uh, human figures on them, but whether those are figures of deities or dancers would be virtually impossible to tell. The construction of the pillars, that sort of roundish or apsidal construction, does very much seem to be a uh, ritual or at least very special purpose kind of structure. And we saw in our excavations of that pillar area, we went down below the level of the big monolithic pillars, and we saw some post holes that were also in a circle. So maybe there was an earlier structure that would have been made you know, of wooden posts or something like that, and then augmented in a grander scale towards the you know, later part of the site's history. So much of what we can say about the religious activities are by proxy within the site, and then also there is a uh, very good and beautiful architectural evidence of both Jain and Buddhist activity, basically within walking distance. Uh, there are caves at Kandagiri and Udayagiri. Um, there is a famous Buddhist site at Tali. Um, so there are Buddhist remains in the region from which we can propose that there was definitely an active landscape of religious activity. Great. Um, so John Armburst wants to know, did it appear that the site was leveled by the ancients at any point? For example, the bases of the central monoliths, were they all at the same level or is this due to time? So Shishapalgar's interior is remarkably flat, isn't it? I mean, we, we generally expect that ancient cities end up having some kind of hummocky appearance, um, even if they're laid out on flat land because you know people build houses and they build houses on top of houses and so on. Um, there is a little bit of an elevation on the interior um, in one area, and that seems to be the longest lived portion of the site. And I think that once the site was occupied and inhabited, when we see the pillar structure, and there's probably other pillar structures that we've also seen through survey, that once the city had been inhabited for a few hundred years, that there was maybe not that much attention to making everything completely flat again, but to using the sort of micro topographies of previous occupations to make a building you know, stand up a little bit higher uh, above the rest of the constructions. Okay, um, several people wanted to know about the animal bones and why you think the animal bones decreased over time. 
Well, this is a preview of coming attractions because there's a graduate student who's working with me, uh, Mr. Stephen Ammerman, um, who has been looking at the animal bones and asking that very question um, when it comes to the chronology um, and to the distribution of animal bones. So I, I you know, I don't want to steal his big conclusions. Um, so that's that's for coming attractions. But your question is a very astute one. Like, what is it about um, either urban life or taphonomic processes in those upper levels that has reduced the kinds of animal bones that that one sees? And you know, when we think about uh, culinary activities and cuisine, which we'll think about in the next archaeology of bridge talk, um, we'll maybe think a little bit about what different types of foodways are in urban environments. Yes, people who are very interested in vegetation too, but do you want to postpone that question also for next time? Tell me about vegetation. What kinds of vegetation questions? They wanted to know, they wanted to know what, what can you say about vegetation? So uh, we have a, an abundance of rice in the deposits. And so we also have an abundance of fish bones. And as you know, might know, the culinary tradition of Eastern India, you know, Odisha, Bengal, Bangladesh, um, is one where fish and rice are a very essential component of the culture. And we can say now that that goes back at least a couple thousand years with you know, great diversity of rice and also some pulses um, lentils um, and that and that sort of thing. Great. Um, so several people want to know what happened to the city. How did it go out of existence? That was also one of our questions from the very beginning, because if the site had a surface that was essentially sealed um, and abandoned after about the fourth century AD, then what happened to it? Because in our modern experience, cities go on and on and on. And it seems to take a great deal to finish off a city. And we were at first thinking of something, you know, the usual suspects of, you know, violence or plague or famine or some kind of disaster. But what seems to have happened in the case of Shishpalgar is not a catastrophic end, but the fact that population seems to have been drawn elsewhere. So about a one and a half kilometers away from Shishpalgar is an area of temples that is known as Old Town Bhubaneswar. And that is built on the Laterite upland and reflects a change of religious activity in the mid first millennium AD um, towards a resurgence that we would think of as a, a hierarchical religious practice that eventually, eventually, many years later, could be characterized as Hinduism, although Hinduism is a very complex, multi-layered term for a variety of localized and disparate and diverse, vibrant traditions. So when we say Hinduism, that really collapses many complex things into a small, uh, a small package. Um, so just think of it as a kind of resurgent Hinduism with a new kind of religious tradition, a new kind of architecture. And what, it's, what seems to have happened at Shishpalgar is that as that new religious center was coming up, people gradually trickled away from Shishpalgar. They continued to use it as you know, a basis for farming, but it was no longer the focal point of urban life. The focal point shifted. Mm -hmm. OK. Um, a, a few more questions, because I think we do have time. Um, Laura would like to know, would like you to talk a little bit more about the shape and style of the pillars that you started us off with. Mm -hmm. um, and is there a functional reason for that shape and design or what, explain a little bit what we were looking at. Yes, so those pillars are essentially unique in the Indian subcontinent as a series of freestanding monoliths um, in the middle of an archeological site. These pillars are also made of laterite, which is that same kind of, you know, crumbly stone. They are very easy to, you know, have crumble, fall apart. So it's really miraculous that they're still standing. Um, we know from art historical depictions like the image that I showed you of urban life uh, that is contemporaneous to Shishpalgar, but not from the site itself. Um, we can see the existence of pillars in the art of the time. 
And so the pillars made of stone probably are an aggrandizement and kind of a copy of what would have been wooden pillars that we have long since uh, lost, but they are really magnificent. I mean, they are, they're huge. They're four meters tall each. Um, and you, you sort of imagine cutting one was already a feat of great skill, cutting a single monolithic block like that, and then cutting it and dragging it to Shishpalgarya, coming in through the gateway, drawn by teams of oxen, or, you know, maybe, you know, a couple of elephants even, um, bringing them into that central location. And then I, this moment of putting them up, like you've cut it, you've dragged it, it's come in one piece, it's this very crumbly stone. Um, and then, you know, you make a socket for it in the ground, and then you get ropes and elephants and people are shouting and cheering and beating drums. And, and then it goes upright, Oh, boom, like that, right? It must have been amazing. And the fact that, you know, there's 14 pillars now, we found another 18, and there are many more still in the ground. So this routine of triumphant construction must have been you know, really galvanizing uh, for people, just like we see cranes and skyscrapers today. So, so this actually leads into a question um, that Julie Herzig had, which was, you showed us that wonderful view of the, the road coming in through the gate. But do you have evidence for any sort of grid system within the city? Um, how, how did that work? How did the, sort of the habitations, what model were they following for laying those out? Yes, that's a, that's a great question. And one that Professor Lal had actually proposed back when he was excavating the site in the 1940s, because you have these, you know, very rectilinear uh, alignments of the rampart, and then each rampart has two gateways on each side. So of course, your eye just sort of draws down and makes a, you know, a grid of nine equal blocks. And we did the gradiometry survey at the strategic locations of where you would expect the two you know, streets, the major avenues to cross. And we could confirm that that was in fact the case, that there was a grid of major streets and then you know, minor streets that came splitting off uh, from each of those major and broad avenues. And so we do have a, a plan of a city and it has been suggested many times um, there is a, a document known as the Arthashastra from approximately the same time period um, that describes how cities ought to be laid out. And there is, uh, you know, this is one of the only examples. Shishpalgar is the only completely rectilinear site uh, with a fortification like this. There is another one um, not far away at Jogad, but it was never fully occupied. There's another one in Bangladesh at Mahastangar. Um, it's not quite so rectilinear, it's very rectilinear, but not quite so perfectly executed um, in terms of having that exact spacing. So Shishpalgar, which you can still see from space if you go to Google Earth and look, um, is really a remarkable site for that detail of planning. Now, the extent to which that planning devolved down to ordinary households um, is, not, is not really clear because we have different types of architecture. We have architecture that's made of stone, um, probably a little bit more high, high status people. And then you have that do-it-yourself stuff where people are turning around the broken bricks. So it does not seem that that level of daily life or how you build your house was regulated in any way. We, when we looked at the houses that we had, sometimes the doorways were facing east and sometimes they were facing south. So within people's own neighborhoods, um, there was much more idiosyncratic kinds of construction. And, and actually someone else asked, because you just mentioned orientations, um, was the, the sort of city wall oriented in a particular way to the cardinal points? That is something that would be a good question to to, at, to answer and look at. Um, 
One of the wonderful things about an archaeological project is that people after the project come up with wonderful questions that you weren't <laughs> thinking of at the time. And, you know, that's that's the great thing about making data available for for future researchers is that, you know, that, let's get someone to take the alignments of Mahasdangar, Shishpalgar and Jogad, um, and then some of the other smaller sites that we've seen that also have, um, you know, kind of town sized rectilinear patterns. And then let's, you know, let's do some calculations. That would be great. Um, several people were interested in burials. Did you find any burials? Do you know what the cultures did in terms of handling the dead? We did not find any human remains. And in fact, in general, in this time period, all throughout the Indian subcontinent, there are very, very few human remains. And um, one thing that we therefore lack is ability to talk about things like health and diet and nutrition um, and you know relative uh, kinds of work patterns that preserve in a human skeleton and so on. Um, culturally speaking, um, it's possible that we have not found the cemeteries that exist in these cities. By now we should have found some, however. Um, so there were probably alternative practices of the end of life rituals um, that means that we, we do not recover human remains. And um, I, I guess we have time for maybe two more questions. Um, several people were interested, are there structures that you could identify as administrative buildings or large palaces or you know, they're interested in the political system and what you might be able to tell from, from the, the um, archeological remains about that? Yes, so a couple of ways that we can address this um, political question. One of them is that, first of all, having anything in such a huge alignment as the rampart certainly bespeaks the existence of somebody who is organizing people to do things. Yes. Um, and then the gradiometry survey around the monolithic pillars identified an area that seemed to have um, its own separate wall, like a, like a precinct of some kind. Um, towards the center portion of the site. It's not exactly in the center, um, but the monolithic pillars and its surrounding area seems to have this kind of constructed perimeter. And then we can also add, there's a little textual evidence that also gives us uh, a sense of the site. Um, in one of those Jain cave areas that's about nine kilometers away, there's an inscription. There are no inscriptions at the site itself, um, but there's a nearby inscription that describes the kind of political history of a ruler named Caravella. And it is basically like the race gestae of Augustus that in his, the first year he did this, the second year he did this, and third year he did this and so on. Um, so one of the first things that he did in the course of his reign was to repair the gateway and fortifications that had been damaged by storm at a cost of 100,000 Karshapanas coins uh, and, and thus pleased all of his subjects. So you know, he was very um, mindful of the ruler's duties of, towards infrastructure. Great, and actually let's end then with an infrastructure question. Um, you, you spend quite a bit of time explaining this interesting material that they're using actually for the fortifications um, mm -hmm. and the pillars and so on. Do we know how far away they had to quarry it? Have you identified the quarry? So one of the challenges of studying anything like mining and quarrying is that a good source of materials is something that will be mined afterwards um, so that the exact locations of the mining of these pillars and the many other types of stone blocks that were used um, has probably long since you know, filled in or been you know, car carved away by medieval people building the temples of Old Town Bhubaneswar. We know that the laterite for the monolithic pillars is particularly compressed and, and fine, which of course you would need for something that large to be able to move it. Um, but we have not identified the, the specific location from which the pillars uh, would have come. I would probably suggest it was the minimum viable distance of good quality materials. 
right? Just for practical reasons, exactly. Um, well, thank you so much. This was fabulous. Um, I wanna just tell everyone who's still on and you've kept most of the audience, which is quite a feat. Um, we will be posting this recording in a few days. So please visit the AIA's YouTube channel to view it. Also, you will see recordings of our past archeology span abridged lectures from last year. And if you would like to support the AIA and programs like this, uh, we would ask you that you text GIVE to 833-965-2840 or visit our website, um, which is www.archaeological.org slash donate. Thank you again. Um, we really appreciated this. And um, uh, we will be back with this, your next lecture next month. Um, and do you want to tell us the title now so people can actually make a note of it? Yes, so it's about the history of Indian food going all the way back to our earliest archaeological remnants and then up through the present. So um, I think that it will be a wonderful time for you to have a South Asian lunch ready. And I look forward to talking with you again soon. Thank you so much.